we should be recording. So you probably have to click something, I would imagine. I do. I have to consent. <laughs> okay. So we are on. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for this. Um, let me just first ask if you can introduce yourself and your role. Sure. My name is Mary Kennedy, and uh, I'm a retiree these days, but uh, I spent most of my life in public service as a lawyer for state agencies in Illinois and, and then in Tennessee. And we moved out here upon retirement in 2018 at the very end of the year and have been here since. And uh, this last year I was elected to the Homeowners Advisory Committee for University Glen. And so now I am more deeply involved in the activities of the community than I had been as we are coming out of the era, we hope, of pandemic and, and moving back into real life on campus. We do hope. And University of Glenn very, is very lucky to have you in that role. Um, okay, can you tell us a little bit uh, a little bit more about University Glenn and about the Homeowners, Homeowners Advisory Council? Sure. University Glen was um, first conceived 20 some years ago when a decision was made to put this university on what had been the site of the former Camarillo State Mental Hospital. And I think most of you probably know about that, that I tell my friends I live at the Hotel California and uh, you know I on a dark desert highway. It's my <laughs> life has become a 70s song. But um, part of the thinking at the time, I think, was that we were sort of out in the country and convenient to nothing. And so some housing on campus would make it more possible for the university to attract faculty who didn't want to have a million miles to drive each way every day to get to work. And also that would it would create a funding stream which would help support the activities of the university. Um, there are, one might question the wisdom of the whole decision to put the university out here and whether a uh, mental hospital site was really the best place to put it. It's not, we're not in the most convenient location in the world. Um, and so transportation can become a challenge for a lot of people. But nevertheless, here we are. And the obviously, there was some thought in mind about who was going to be in the community because it was set up so that there were a series of priorities as to who could purchase a home in the community. And there are single family homes. There are townhouses. In addition, there are apartment communities which are not now commonly owned by the university, um, but we share the same general area. And the system of priorities put faculty at the top, you know, and then university staff, and then a series of steps, including local educators. So people who taught at the junior colleges, people who teach up at Calu, people who teach in the high school districts, and then you know people who teach in the grade school districts and so forth um and sort of stepped all the way down to mere mortals <laughs> and my husband and i um, although my husband had worked in higher ed for the last 14 15 years of his life as university counsel for the tennessee state university system the tennessee board of regents we were among mere mortals so when uh, we determined in anticipation of retirement that um, we have family in California, we wanted to move west, and then we stumbled across this really by accident and said, oh, wow, living on a college campus, how cool would that be? You know, so that was a huge draw for us. And in fact, it was such a big draw that we got on a waiting list and sat for two years. Oh my. Before a place opened up that we were able to purchase. But at that time, the, they were having some, um, some funding issues and decided to sell off a number of townhomes, which had been held as rental units. And we were able to buy in then. So that's how we came to be here. Nice. Very, very good. Um, okay. 
Um, now let's move on to the, the project that we're going to be doing with and for you. Um, mm -hmm. Can you describe what kind of project we can we can work on to provide for you uh, that would be helpful and a, a general sense of its goals? Sure. Um, let me start with an old you know cliche, and that is that all politics are local. Okay, and even within University Glen, we have kind of a microcosm of what our local politics about. And a big piece of that is how do we interact with the bigger university? You know, do we exist merely as a funding stream or are we a vital and integral part of university life? Now, I've lived in the past, I've, I was fortunate um, I went to college in Chicago and lived on a stretch of, the, of uh, a road which included both Loyola where I went and a, a mile and a half or two miles up further north Northwestern. And so university life there was everywhere. Uh, um, the businesses were supported by the presence of the university and um, Everybody interacted with everybody. Um, likewise, I got to go to graduate school in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the university is the core of the town. And frankly, when we got here, we were a little disappointed that the relationship between the university and the community is not as robust as we think it could be. And the more I began to explore what was actually going on on campus and compare it to what I was hearing about as a resident, I realized that there was a chasm between the two and that there was some really cool stuff going on on the campus that we never heard about yeah. you know, within spinning distance. So um, my, my mission then, um, you know, I've kind of taken on this, this mission of seeing what are ways that we can bring those two communities together for everybody's benefit. For example, one thing that's going to be going on soon and I think is wonderful um, is the building of a new daycare center. And this is, this is the perfect example of the kind of synergy that I'd love to see everywhere because it's win, win, win. It's when because families out here have a place close to home where they know they can safely bring their children um, for daycare. It's when because it's a place where students can get hands-on experience with early childhood education. You know, it's, a, it's wonderful for the kids because they get the benefit of being really in an educational setting and not just being sort of parked somewhere. So this is exactly the kind of thing I would like to see going on all over. We've availed ourselves, and it's been great, of the uh, Osher Lifelong Learning classes mm -hmm. on campus. And I'm, I'm sorry, but you got to tell your students that unless they've turned 55, they can't do this yet. This is foreclosed to them for a bit, but they are wonderful, wonderful courses where we just signed up for another whole bunch of them. And we'll take a class that goes like six weeks. And, and it's great because there are no tests, which is good in your old age when you can't actually remember stuff <laughs> to regurgitate it. But um, there are no tests and, um, and we just get to go listen to people talk about wonderful stuff that I'm going, how did I not learn this when I was in college? Yeah. I missed a lot. So there's a good example of that synergy that you mentioned. So, so the project then is to, to do a survey of residents. Right. A survey of residents and perhaps survey some faculty as well to find out on both sides of that equation, where are there opportunities for the two to meet? You know, I can I can think of some other things that you know my husband and I have have uh, written to the head of the music department and said, "Hey, tell us when you got somebody on campus." And we've wandered on down just to sit in the back of a class and listen 
to a visiting musician. Well, there are plays on campus from the drama department, but they never get advertised over here. No? Yeah, yeah. I would love to see that kind of stuff. I'd love to see open mic night in the town center, for example, or if there are if there are students who are learning improv, I'd love to see improv practice or all the many other things. I'd love to have opportunities to take more advantage of the library. We have a beautiful library and a really great dedicated library staff and things going on there that we're not hearing about. And perhaps we can add value to that as well. There are, you know, my husband and I have said we would mentor a student, you know, spend um, an evening or a couple of evenings a month and have dinner with somebody and talk to them about how's your college experience going and are, are you ready for the next semester and have you thought about what you're going to take and, you know, um, can we be of, of assistance to you in any way? So, yeah. and there are all kinds of people among my neighbors. We have retired educators, we have current educators um, who have never been asked, you know, what's your area of expertise? Is there something you could, could you be a guest in a classroom? Could you lecture somebody about something? Is there, I have one neighbor who's a constitutional historian, you know, and also an archivist. Well, maybe he'd like to, you know, spend a little time with some students teaching them how to archive materials. Okay, great. So, that sort of thing. so finding out what some of the possibility, some of the interests are and some of the possibilities for, for developing those, those connections. Both ways, yes. Okay, all right, fantastic. Um, so the final thing I wanted to ask is, what do you imagine would be the, uh, the benefit of this kind of a research project? Oh, I think there are a lot of benefits. First, it's a, um, a, you get to take a good look at the way a little community interacts, at the way it sets priorities, you know, decides what's important, at the way it may choose to execute on those decisions. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned about that. I think it's um, it becomes a little exercise in citizenship, you know, and in leadership. How can we learn? How can someone be a good leader if they can't learn what's important, and then find a way to bring those important ideas to bearing fruit? So I I think that would be the benefit. I think the university could benefit um, both from the the addition of soft skills, but also there's there's some economic ways the university might benefit, you know, selling tickets for those shows or or if there are meals going on eaten at the end of the day at the Islands Cafe, perhaps, you know, once in a while, a few old people might wander down that way or or families with little kids and mom just she's too beat to cook tonight. And why not drop by and, uh, you know, expose ourselves to to that, and I, um, as a, as an actual senior citizen now, um, I think there's probably no greater uh, antidote to getting old than the opportunity to, um, to interact with people younger. So, all right. Well, that sounds like a lot of a lot of good things we can accomplish with this project. Well, I hope so. Yeah, so we will look forward to working with you and talk, talking with you soon and working with you on this this spring. But that gives us, I think, a real good sense of, uh, of, the, of the starting point. Excellent. We've put out a call for people who are willing to serve on a focus group or groups. And we have tried to identify potential members who cut across the whole spectrum of what we've got here. So people who are long timers, people who just got here, people who are young families with kids, people who are retirees, people who are working, um, you know, and the whole uh, people in townhomes, people in houses, people in the apartments, are their interests different? And if so, why? Uh, so there's, um, you should get a good cross section of folks and we hope we can get good ideas from them. Great. Well, thank you very much, and we will be in touch. Okay, thank you, Des. Okay.
Let me turn off the recording here.